te arohae. Te mata tata te karakia tua tahi mua ta mata um, hiri mai ta mata um, na te minita o te upo o awa o te aroa. Tu tata karakia muhi o tia i a mata e te atua whakatufira tia mai ki a mata i tēnei rā nā kuaha o te tika o te pono, o te māramatana, a mātou koe hei whakamoemiti, hei whakakroria ki tau inoa tapu. Āmine. Kia tau te rangi Māori e runa i a tātou katoa, nō rei rā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ka huri te rā. E rere ana hau e ki te rangi, huri atu taku tituro ki te rohi o te pane o te ika. Mai tura ki rai, piki atu ki poki atua, rere atu ki te uta ki remu taka. Heke heke iho ki parirahu, ki pōkai mangu mangu, rere tōteka ki korukoro, a tau te mano ki kō nei, ki wai whetu, e tau nei. Apati hono tātai hono, te honga mate ki te honga mate. Apati hono tātai hono, te honga ora ki te honga ora. He mihi mahana ki a koutou, ngā kano he ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Hui hui mai tātou katoa. Welcome to the mighty Hutt Valley. And as you can see... And as you can see from outside in the houses around, there might be a few blue signs, but there's damn few more red ones out there today. I'd like to acknowledge all of the volunteers here, and I'd also like to acknowledge those of the Veggie Co-op who have worked here for over 10 years, providing this community with fresh fruit and veggies at an affordable price. Uh, over 250 bags on a Tuesday go out of here every single week. So I'd like to acknowledge that. And volunteer sign-ups for Hut South uh, down the back. Just talk to Lucy. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce someone very special today. She is someone who many communities right around New Zealand are so proud to have as Deputy Prime Minister. I'm incredibly proud to have this woman uh, here today. She does an amazing job. I'd like to welcome Carmel Cipollone. <laughs> Good afternoon everyone and acknowledging you Ginny as an amazing powerhouse local MP who I have no doubt is going to take this seat out again. <laughs> There's nothing that screams a looming election like being in and amongst our hearty and loyal Labour supporters. Can I thank you all for turning out today? It is so awesome to see all of you. When we came into government in 2017, I spoke about our promise to deliver for low and middle income families and to ensure our welfare system is fair and treats people with dignity. Five years ago, we introduced our families package. It was the biggest boost to household incomes in a decade for thousands of New Zealand families. Through the Families Package, we increased a range of payments and supports to help families, including boosting the family tax credit and increasing paid parental leave to 26 weeks. In addition to that, we've introduced the Best Start Payment, the Winter Energy Payment. We've lifted benefit incomes across the board more than any other previous government and expanded and made childcare assistance more affordable. I think we should clap for those things. In 2004, the Helen Clark Labor government introduced Working for Families. This marked a someone wants to clap for me. <laughs> this marked a major advance in the government's work to support people into sustainable employment, improve family standard of living, and help people to achieve economic independence. At that point in time, it was the biggest change to New Zealand's social assistance system in over a decade. It was a package that put commitments into action. What does that tell you? It tells you that only a Labour government has the willingness, ambition and track record to deliver for working families. Support 
14 working families has always been our bread and butter. This is reflected in the fact that more than 110,000 people have joined the workforce in the past year. The employment rate is the highest rate recorded since records began in 1986. For those receiving a main benefit, total incomes after housing costs are 48% higher than at the end of 2017 after adjusting for inflation. We have fewer children in poverty, wages are up and more people are in work. As I've always said, there is certainly more mahi to do, and that's why we need to re-elect a Labour government. <laughs> there is far too much at stake. The National Party have a tendency to pull the ladder up from hard-working New Zealanders. We saw this in 2010 when they froze income thresholds for childcare assistance. We saw it when they took away the training incentive allowance. That's what we can expect with the National and ACT coalition of cuts. Families have always been a focus of any Labour government. We want to make New Zealand the best place to live, work, do business and raise a family. Our commitment to supporting families is not just a matter of policy, but a moral imperative that shapes the very foundation of Aotearoa New Zealand. Our track record is very clear and demonstrated, our commitment is demonstrated uh, across the course of the policies that we have introduced over many decades. The announcement you'll hear today from the Prime Minister underpins the sentiment that the journey ahead is not only for us, but for the generations that follow. Before you get an opportunity to hear from the Prime Minister, I have the great privilege of welcoming up one of the people who I believe has been one of the best finance ministers ever. Uh, I think you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> A friend to many, certainly not unfamiliar to all of those in Wellington, and someone who I'm very proud to be able to call a colleague and friend, the Honourable Grant Robertson. Tihe mori ora, he mihi ana na mana whenua ki tēnei rohi e na mana e na reo rauranga tirama tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Carmel. Um, I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge Carmel and the extraordinary work that she has done over the last few years for low and middle income New Zealanders in particular. Those people have received meaningful income increases in large part because of Carmel's work. One of my proudest moments was announcing the budget that restored main benefits to the equivalent value that they were before Ruth Richardson's mother of all budgets. Along with that, we've lifted family tax credits, increased support for superannuitants and students, and strengthened our work with community organisations. It was Carmel's work that got us there, her staunch advocacy for the most vulnerable in our society and for our working people is an inspiration to me. Thank you so much, Carmel. I want to acknowledge Ginny, all the other candidates, and you, our supporters and volunteers. It's your hard work that will get us over the line on the 14th of October. I want to thank St Paul's for allowing us to use this venue today. I don't want to present myself as any kind of saint, but I've been on my own road to Damascus when it comes to the announcements we're making today. <laughs> Friends, there is no doubt that this is a tough time for many New Zealanders. After a hard few years facing the COVID pandemic, a slowing global economy and the pressure on the cost of living that's affecting so many households and businesses, it has been hard. For those of us who go to the supermarket more than once a month, those pressures are starkly clear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really proud of how we've stood with and supported New Zealanders through these challenging last few years. We had to take some big decisions. We had no playbook to guide us. 
But we've done what we always do in the Labour Party. We've put people first to make sure that people are healthy, that they can stay and work, and that they can look after their kids. And that is the big question at this election. Who is there to stand with you when times are tough? Who is in it for you, and who is just in it for them and their mates? Labour has the track record of getting the balance right between supporting people and looking out for the future by being careful with the government's books. And that's required more than ever at this election. We all know that the big investments that we made to get us all through COVID can't go on forever. There's not room at this election for big promises, but there's always room for looking after each other and for doing every bit we can to take pressure off households. Working Kiwis have been our focus since day one, as Carmel's just said, with the families package, protecting jobs during COVID with the wage subsidy, and now, as times are tough again, with the cost of living pressures that we're seeing during this global inflation spike and a weaker global economy that's putting pressure on the government's books. The announcements we are making today highlight the values that Labor will have under a Chris Hipkins government and that we will protect over the next three years. That we look after the most vulnerable in our society. That we help working Kiwis get ahead and that we make sure we protect future generations. They are the policies, they are the values that are at risk from a change of government. This election, there are real choices for Kiwis to think about at the polling booth. A party led by Chris Hipkins that's in it for them against a guy who's in it for himself, who wants to give himself and his mates a massive tax cut. They're not Kiwi values, they're not what this country's about, and that's what we have to stop on October the 14th. <laughs> The policies that we're announcing today will help provide support where it's needed most. These are tough times, not just in New Zealand, but around the world. And while the economic cycle that we're in will get better as inflation drops and the economy grows, we have to make sure that our response in the here and now doesn't undermine all the important frontline services that Kiwi families rely on. Now, there's one thing that my colleagues get pretty bored of from me saying, and that's, how's this going to be paid for? But it matters to be able to answer that question. National like to say that they'll offer tax cuts, but that everything else will all be the same. And, magically, they'll reduce our debt as a country as well. It's Paul Goldsmith's fiscal Bermuda Triangle all over again. It doesn't add up, and it's all of our job to call that out. What I can tell you today is that Labor is committed to funding and providing the public services that New Zealanders rely on. Public health care, education, housing, all of the essential services that take pressures off Kiwis in their everyday lives. They are what Labor has been focused on rebuilding when we came into office, protecting during the pandemic, and now prioritising for investment amid a tough fiscal backdrop. And you can see from the commitments we're making today, at the budget, and even just over the past couple of weeks, where our priorities lie. Record pay increases for nurses to protect 8,000 extra nurses that we've hired since 2017. Last week's... <laughs> Last week's pay increases for teachers, meaning they're earning 34% more over the six years of our government compared to increases of 10% over the previous nine years. And taking pressure off Kiwis in their everyday lives, like removing the $5 prescription charge, reducing the cost of public transport, and supporting parents back into work with cheaper ECE for two-year-olds. Now, the finances are tight and as they are for countries all around the world at this time. And we'll keep looking for ways to make savings and be more efficient. And we do that while protecting what matters most. It means that we look at our values and New Zealand's values and we prioritise our investments on what matters to the hard-working people across New Zealand.
These are the values that I, applied, I have applied in my job as Minister of Finance over the past six years. During the initial budgets, we had record surpluses that we used to reduce debt. During the biggest economic downturn since World War II, as the pandemic closed down our economy, we looked after our businesses and our households. And now, with the global inflation spike, we're trying to take the pressure off working people. So I leave you with this thought. While times are tough now, there are hopeful times ahead. If we keep our head, if we get the balance right, if we invest in our people, our potential is unlimited. There is a better tomorrow ahead. And to reach that better tomorrow, we need a leader who gets it for working families, who understands our country's values and has the vision to put them into practice. A leader who is in it for you, your family and your community. I know that we have that leader who will take us to victory in October. So please welcome my friend, your leader, Chris Hipkins. It is fantastic to be with you here in the mighty Hutt Valley today with just 62 days to go until the next general election. This is the community that I grew up in. It's where I got a huge amount of support from loving parents, a great education, and a community that was willing to support me to be all that I could be. That's what I want for every Kiwi family. People here in the hut don't ask for a lot, and I think that's true of New Zealanders right the way across the country. They just want to know that their hard work will be rewarded with a better lot in life for themselves and for the people who they love. Or as Norman Kirk so perfectly put it, there are four things that matter to people. They have to have somewhere to live. They have to have food to eat. They have to have clothing to wear. And they have to have something to hope for. That's what Labour has always stood for, and it's what I stand for. Bread and butter issues like good, affordable housing, and especially good state housing for those most in need. This is a community I'm very familiar with, and it's important to acknowledge while we're here today in Lower Hutt, that in this very neighbourhood here, many of the family homes here were built as state houses. We are building more state houses under our government than any government since the Nash government of the 1950s. <laughs> Great things happen when a boy from the hut's in charge. <laughs> Because that's what our government has been all about. Opportunities for the future, something to get out of bed for. We've grown wages faster than inflation over the term of our government. We've made the largest ever increases to the minimum wage and we reversed Ruth Richardson's benefit cuts. <laughs> We've been focused on creating hope and opportunity for the future through major new trade deals, through boosting our exports, through investing in skills and young people. I know that it's a really tough time for many New Zealanders at the moment. We've been in a tough economic cycle and we are now starting to come out the other side of that. While it's been tough, 
Our government, our Labour team has never forgotten our roots, where we come from or who we are in it for. New Zealanders need the stability and support that comes from a Labour government. Can I thank Carmel and Grant for their introductions today. We are so lucky to have you in charge of our social support system and in charge of our economy. Yeah. They have done an incredible job. Under Grant's guidance, New Zealand's economy has delivered eight quarters of unemployment below 4%. That's happened only twice in our recent history, and never under the sort of challenging economic circumstances we faced following the global COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> we said throughout our response to COVID-19 that our job was to save lives and to save livelihoods, and we did both of those things. New Zealand's near record low unemployment is testament to the fantastic leadership that we have seen from our economic team led by Grant Robertson, who has put a huge amount of work into protecting and creating jobs. I've often said that the most important thing that we could do in a cost of living crisis was to keep people in work, and that is what we have done. When times are tough, a job offers people economic security and protection. And we've worked hard to ensure that that protection is available to as many Kiwis as possible. The other thing to do in a cost of living crisis is to make sure that nobody gets left behind. It's our people on the lowest incomes who have been the most susceptible to the price increases that we have seen over the past few years. Carmel has helped to ensure that they've been able to stay afloat. Carmel guaranteed that an elderly couple on super now gets $100 more in each pay to cover their basics. That's on top of the winter energy payment, which the ACT Party want to cut. Carmel has ensured that benefits have increased this year, meaning that a family with children receive an extra $40 a week and a sole parent will receive an extra $31 a week. The work that Carmel has led in government has helped to lift 77,000 New Zealand children out of poverty. <laughs> Despite the most challenging economic conditions that we have faced in a generation, Labor has ensured that Kiwi families have not been going backwards. Carmel and Grant, your work has been critical for Kiwi families. You've proudly done all that you can to make life that little bit easier for those who need that. Michael Joseph Savage called that applied Christianity. My good friend and predecessor Jacinda Ardern called it kindness. I call it, I call it the bread and butter of good government and there is more to come. The two most important things that we can do to help Kiwi households at the moment is make sure we're focused on bringing inflation down and make sure wages are continuing to grow. On inflation, we are starting to win that battle. While there's still a way to go, most commentators are picking that inflation and interest rates have now peaked and that both will start to fall over the coming year. That's good news for those with a mortgage and it's good news for those who rent as well. The government's been doing its bit to make sure that's a reality. By winding up all of our COVID-19 spending and looking for appropriate savings, we've been making sure that we're getting inflation pointing back in the right direction. Since I became the leader, we found over $4 billion in savings that we've been able to reinvest in the public services that New Zealanders rely on. This year's budget was carefully balanced though to make sure that we didn't add to inflationary pressure. And the Reserve Bank, never always particularly complimentary, have confirmed that our approach has been more friend than foe when it comes to the battle against inflation. 
Projections now see inflation falling to around 4.5% by the end of this year. And there is some good news on food prices as well that came out on Friday. Food prices fell in July, the first monthly decrease since February last year. We are turning the corner. On wages, I've said our focus has been on keeping people in work whilst increasing their wages. A tax cut won't mean much to someone who has lost their job because of the coalition of cuts. Yeah. With prices and mortgages going up, I know that families are feeling it. But average wages have been outstripping inflation whilst we have been in government. Since 2017, average hourly earnings have gone up by 29%, while inflation during that time has gone up by 22.5%. Our decision to increase the minimum wage earlier this year delivered workers on the lowest wages the biggest ever increase. We've ensured that those at the bottom haven't been left behind. As an employer, we've also been taking steps to increase the wages of our public sector workers and the key workforces that rely on the government for funding. To give you a couple of examples, when Labor took office in 2017, the top of the registered nurse pay scale was $66,755 a year. When their latest collective agreement that has just been ratified is fully implemented, that will be 106,738. <laughs> That's an increase of nearly $40,000 or just under 60% in only six years. Let's talk about our teachers. Because of the latest pay deal that they have just ratified, the top of their pay scale will have had an increase of $27,000 a year under our government, or 36%, compared to the mere 10% increase that they got under the nine years of the last national government. In fact, 67% of secondary teachers will now earn a base salary of more than $100,000 a year, showing how much we value that critical workforce. Some would say that this approach is crazy, increasing wages in tough economic times, but I see that somewhat differently. Now is exactly the time to invest in our nurses, our teachers and our vital public sector workers to funnel money into our economy to support it to grow by giving extra support to those who need and deserve it the most. I'm proud of our record as a government on wage growth and the recognition that our valuable public sector workers have been receiving. But you didn't come here today just to hear about our record. Elections fundamentally are about the future. They're also about leadership and about who best re represents you and your family. Now I know our team has not had a perfect year. We've made a few mistakes and at times it may have looked like we were a bit more focused on ourselves than we've been focused on you. I accept that, but let me be clear. At no point has my focus or my values wavered from the job that I set out to do when I became Prime Minister just seven months ago. I've put supporting Kiwi families with the cost of living front and centre of the government's work programme. No matter what else might have been going on, that's what I am in this job to do, and that is my ongoing pledge to New Zealanders. At this election, New Zealanders will have a very clear choice. A coalition more focused on cutting jobs than creating them, or Labour and our proven record on job creation and employment. A choice between national tax cuts that are weighted towards the wealthy, and real ongoing cost of living support for working families. Millionaires do not need a tax cut right now. But I know that you need cost of living support and that is what Labour will provide.
today I am announcing the next steps in Labor's 10-point cost of living plan that's focused on providing targeted, long-term cost of living support for Kiwi families. The first two steps I've just mentioned, bringing inflation under control and growing wages so that families can get ahead and enjoy the benefits that should flow from their hard work. The next three steps in our 10-point plan were announced in this year's budget. Free prescriptions. Yes. Cheaper childcare by extending 20 hours free early childhood education to two-year-olds. And making public transport permanently free for those under, uh, those under 13 and half price for those under 25. All of these measures would be at risk under a National Act government. They have said they would reintroduce prescription charges. They don't support 20 hours free early childhood education for two-year-olds. And kids and young people will be paying once again for the bus and train under the Coalition of Cuts, who it seems are more committed to accelerating climate emissions than cutting the cost of living. Today I can set out the next two steps in our plan. I know that food is a big cost for families. Despite the time pressure that, goes with coming, that comes with this job, I still like to get out and about and do my own shopping from time to time. <laughs> and I like to keep an eye on the food prices at the supermarket, although I confess these days I do have to do a little bit of my grocery shopping online. It creates a bit of a stir when I go to the supermarket. <laughs> but I know that I'm lucky to earn a salary that means that I can buy what I need to buy in the supermarket without having to worry about whether I'm going to be able to pay for it when I get to the checkout. And when I do visit the checkout in the supermarket, I have seen people putting things back because the final tally on their bill is too much. And I can tell you that the things that they're putting back are not luxury items. They are basics that they are having to go without. And I think we need to do something about that. Food prices are 9.6% higher today than they were just a year ago. Fruit and vegetable prices in particular have been incredibly volatile. We know that they've increased 22% in the year to June and 18% in the year to May. And in part that's because of the terrible weather events that we've faced. The storms and the cyclone have played havoc with our supply chain. They've disrupted our growers and they've damaged their crops. And people are paying more at the supermarket because of that. I can't control the weather, but I can do something about food prices. Today I'm announcing that if re-elected, Labor will remove GST from fresh and frozen fruit and veggies from the 1st of April next year. GST from fruit and vegetables will ease the pressure on, fa on families at the checkout while we get through this current inflation recycle, but it will also mean that families can make healthier choices when they're at the supermarket. Other countries like Australia take GST off fresh fruit and vegetables and there is no reason why we cannot do that here. In fact, in most countries that have GST or a value-added tax, they have a variety of different carve-outs for certain items. If anything, New Zealand is an international outlier in that we apply GST to almost everything. Some of the tax purists will say that we should not do this. They will always be able to find a reason not to do something. But they are not the ones who are struggling to pay for their grocery bills when they reach the checkout at the supermarket. They're not the ones who are having to remove things from their trolleys. This policy is aimed at the New Zealanders for whom every dollar at the checkout matters, because I am in it for them. But it doesn't end there. Today I'm also announcing that if re-elected, 
On the 1st of April next year, we will make the largest ever increase to the Working for Families in Work tax credit. It's an increase that will see 160,000 families $25 a week better off under Labor. And before the end of next term, we'll also be lifting the Working for Families abatement threshold to $50,000, meaning 175,000 families will gain on average $47 extra a week. The combined effect of the two announcements that I've made today mean that many low and middle income families will be up to $50 a week better off once these changes have been made. That's real cost of living support. And I note it is more than the National Party are offering many low to middle income New Zealanders through their proposed tax cuts. At this election, Labour will be putting the cost of living front and centre. We know that the cost of living is the biggest issue currently facing New Zealand households. This is also what I'm about as Prime Minister. My vision as Prime Minister is for New Zealand to be a country that is just bursting with opportunities that all Kiwis get to benefit from. A country where people can see the rewards for their hard work so that they can create a better life for themselves and for the people who they love. Would I like to do more? Of course I would. But I'm also realistic that in the current economic environment, now is not the right time for big inflationary spending or big inflationary tax cuts. If I'm going to target support, I'd rather give it to mums and dads than to millionaires. Providing targeted support to cut the cost of basics like food, prescriptions, childcare and transport is a better plan and it's smarter economics. New Zealanders have a very clear choice at this election. My message to Kiwis is very simple. I understand your concerns and I am on your side. I will deliver on the issues that matter the most to you. When you weigh up the policies that are on offer, our 10-point cost of living package will offer permanent and long-term savings that tax cuts simply do not. But these changes will only happen if Labor is re-elected. My promise to you is that I will do all that I possibly can in the next nine weeks to make sure we are re-elected. There is simply too much at stake at this election. I am in it for you. I am in it for anyone who no longer has to put their health needs second because they cannot afford to collect their prescriptions. I'm in it for the parents who are juggling work and young kids and expensive childcare costs. I'm in it for the environment and for cheaper public transport. I'm in it for our teachers, our nurses, our public servants who look after our communities day in and day out. I'm in it for our superannuitants and the most vulnerable among us. I'm in it for our young people, ensuring that they have the opportunities and the support that they need to live amazing lives. I am in it for you. So if you are with me, if you think New Zealand does better when families do better, if you want to fix the cost of living crisis and help people to get ahead, if you want to bring down our emissions and ensure that we remain the cleanest, greenest economy in the world, then let's get out and campaign our hearts out. Let's win this campaign and let's re-elect a Labour government. <laughs>
Most New Zealanders buy fresh fruit and vegetables. This policy will benefit all New Zealanders. Yes, millionaires spend more at the supermarket, but actually if you look at the proportions of the grocery bill um, that go on fresh fruit and vegetables, it's lower income New Zealanders that spend a higher proportion of their... Um, of their um, of their grocery bill on fresh fruit and vegetables. Your criticism, though, is that the other side is giving tax cuts to millionaires when you're doing exactly the same thing. Well, we're doing something that will benefit all New Zealanders at the supermarket. Well, that's really good. Uh, If you looked at how you could give people um, you know, s support of that quantum through other means, actually it does stack up as quite a good uh, alternative to, uh, you know, to, to tax cuts, for example, which cost a lot more and don't give many New Zealanders um, much more than $5 a week. And in some cases, for minimum wage New Zealanders, it gives them a lot less. Why is there suddenly a meaningful difference, though, five um, I think that for New Zealand families who are going to the supermarket and recording every single item that they're putting in their grocery trolley because they're worried they won't be able to pay at the checkout. A modest uh, saving through not having GST of fresh fruit and veg and frozen fruit and veg will make a difference. Why is that $2 billion is going on at admin and the processing of the tax? Um, we can, uh, the very, very, very small amount. What, why, is, why, is this, yeah, exactly. why is this a great idea now when up until very recently your, lab, uh, your party and in fact your, many of your ministers have been very critical of this move? Well, I, mean, I, I, I know who that question is directed at, and I'll let him answer for himself. But I do want to be clear here. We've looked really closely at where the cost of living is biting. We know that fresh fruit and vegetables, frozen fruit and vegetables, have been particularly affected by recent disruptions to the supply chain, particularly because of the weather. It is an area where, where families have been cutting back on more than others. So if we look at the proportion of their grocery spend that's going on fresh fruit and veg and on frozen fruit and veg, that's actually down um, in recent years compared to what it was before. Before. So this is something that we can do that will actually make a difference for them. Ex there are other countries around the world that do this all of the time. Ex but Ex Grant, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let Grant answer. Yeah, look, I mean, if you go back and look at the comments I made, I had two main concerns. The first of those was, would this get passed on? And you would have seen in the announcement today that we're talking about the Grocery Commissioner having that role. We did not have that person previously. Now they've got the job to do to make sure that supermarkets in particular do pass this on. What? And secondly, two things, Jason. Um, and secondly, uh, making sure that the tax system we had was one that was stable and sound and efficient. And I've been convinced that looking around the world, other countries can do this. And actually, doing something directly about the price of food matters sufficiently to me that we can make that can change. You name what, can you name one tax expert or economist that thinks this is a good idea? I can name a whole lot of tax experts and economists uh, who think that the tax system should never be changed. In reality, as I've said earlier, they are not, they are not the people. People, well, they are not the people who are having to take not, items this, this out of their not for them. This policy is for the people who yes, go to the supermarket. Yes, but generally you rely on, on experts and, and subject matters such as tax, and, and often you would cite them as supporting it or not. So can you name one that would support it or thinks it's a good idea? Uh, other countries do it. Why, do you think, do you, why not meet? What? Why not meet? Um, this is what's affordable. Um, it's targeted at fresh fruit and vegetables and frozen fruit and vegetables because that's a, that's a, it's a relatively clear delineation. It means it's a reasonably clear group um, that we can target, group of products that we can target, um, and it is affordable. Can you walk us through that? There will always be more things that could be included. We've come up with a package that we can afford right can you now. Can one can fruit and one can fruit and vegetables? The, the distinction that we've made is the difference between unprocessed and processed. So fresh fruit and vegetables, frozen fruit and vegetables, where they, where they haven't had a processing element to them, that's relatively easy to but define. Can you walk us through all that it is to buy a, an ear of corn, right? And a lot of families will look at that and go, I need the can of corn. Why not take it off the can of corn? Well, they will still have that choice if it's cheaper. Can, can you walk, us, can you walk us through what sort of teeth the grocery commissioner is going to have in this? If, he, if you find that the supermarkets are not passing on the prices, what can they actually tangibly do to make sure that this actually happens? Yeah, look, so the grocery commission has just been set up. They have the code of conduct that they'll be using. Uh, the Commerce Commission powers are now effectively vested into the grocery commissioner. So as that person does their work, I imagine they'll be able to uh, use the powers of the commission to be able to enforce this. So what's that? Is that fine?
fines? Potentially, or? yeah, there's a range of things. It's only just been established, right. as you know. Right. Okay. Jessica. Australia obviously does a much more comprehensive policy. They have a lot more things that are, are exempt. How deeply did you look into that and whether we could exempt all food, which is something to Papa Māori would like to see? We looked at a range of different tax models around GST around the world. Um, the challenge of adding more things in is that every, every extra item that you add in adds extra cost. This is a relatively contained group of costs. We can afford to do this as a country right now. How far down the track did you go for other products? Um, as I said, we, we were looking at what we could afford. Um, we can afford doing this now. Prime Minister, I've got a bit of a shopping list. I wouldn't mind running through <laughs> whether things have got GST or, or won't be applied. Cut pineapple. Um, that's fresh and it's unprocessed. Semi-dried tomato? Uh, if they're dried, oh, I don't know what, depends how semi-dried semi <laughs> is. I'd have to, we'd have to look at that, but clearly um, the distinction will be between processed and unprocessed, so dried products are processed. A bag of combined lettuce and spinach? Uh, that, is, uh, that will be covered. That will be covered at zero? Or that will be zero rated, and, yeah. And what about a combined bag of peas and frozen peas and corn? That will also be covered. What about coleslaw? Uh, that, that has value added to it, so it has extra ingredients added into it so it won't be covered. So if it has a bag of coleslaw in the salad aisle? If it has mayonnaise added into it, then it won't be covered. Isn't this exactly the kind of problem with this policy? That, you there, know, it opens there, up there all these questions about what's in, what's out, and then questions about why other products should not be included. The idea that we don't have those distinctions in our tax system at the moment is false. So if you look at accommodation, for example, we don't charge GST on rents, but we do charge GST if, you, um, if you're hiring a hotel room. Uh, for those who are living in service departments, there's a clear di distinction there. So there are already arguments about where the line is on things that are in and out at the moment. Um, there always will be so in the tax who's system. Decide, who's going to decide exactly what is and what is is not out because people will be coming, obviously, products that were suggestions. You know, who, who will be the determiner? So we will have a technical group to make sure that the technical details of this will work through before the 1st of April next year when it comes up. Minister uh, Robinson, you talked about, um, quite fittingly actually, in St Paul's Church here, your road to Damascus. When exactly did you see the light on this one? And were you shown the light or did you find it yourself? Well, it's quite a spiritual and existential question <laughs> that you've asked me, Jason. Look, for me, this has been about working out what we can practically do to help people in a cost of living crisis. And as I said, once the Grocery Commissioner role had been established, that dealt with one of my most significant issues about whether it will be passed on. But the big thing that I've realised over the last you know, year or so is that the price of food and the things that people buy when they go to the supermarket have been putting a lot of pressure on them. Now, every other country in the world basically can do this, so there's no reason why we can't, and I believe that it's important that we put a line in the sand and say to New Zealanders, we're on their side when it comes to going to the supermarket. So it was, it was a grocery market commissioner that was the thing that pushed you over the line. So did you fight for that to be included? Or did were you sort of said that this is something that can be added on to help I don't think, I understand that you won't have been in our policy making sessions, but it's not about fighting for something, it's about coming to an agreement and I believe this is the right thing for us to do. Richard. The removal of the depreciation on non-residential uh, non, um, non buildings, your answer to the criticism you've got over axing the proposals on the wealth tax. We said all along that we were going to be winding, well, certainly since the beginning of the year, that we have been focused on winding back the temporary support that we put in place during COVID-19. This was one of the supports that we put in place during COVID-19. Um, it is now time to wind it back again. It's $545 million a year is, the, is Treasury's uh, estimate for that. So that helps pay for all of the commitments we've made today. And I would note, obviously, we've made the Working for Families commitments today as well, what, what which are a very targeted measure. Hang on, we'll come over here. Um, why not something more targeted to lower, lower socioeconomic people, maybe like vouchers or something like that, so that you're not giving tax cuts to millionaires? Well, we've been very targeted in um, making sure that the working for families support that we're providing is actually focused on those families um, who will be on middle and lower incomes to make sure that we are giving them extra support. Well, Jessica. Just following up from Jane's question before about the economists. This isn't really about that, though, is it? This is about pure politics. You're eight weeks out from an election. You're behind in the polls. This is just good retail politics. This is about providing meaningful support for New Zealanders who have been struggling with the increased cost of living. Who you're trying to entice to vote for you. Well, well it's an election. <laughs> <laughs> property owners, but the commercial property sector is having a hard time at the moment. 
So what advice do you receive on whether they can absorb that additional cost? Well, um, I mean, you've answered your own question in a way, Janae. I mean, this was brought in as a temporary measure during COVID. Bear in mind the National Party got rid of it in 2010 in a similar set of economic circumstances. Uh, our priority is working people. Our priority is those on the lowest incomes. The other working people need to be employed and they need somewhere to work. So, you know, we'll what, what, what you say to that? Unemployment's at one of its most historically low levels. Okay. You've said that fresh fruit and abatement changes. Why are you not bringing that in until 2026 when currently the abatement rate is lower than the minimum wage? It's about spreading the cost to make sure the overall package that we're doing is affordable. As I've been really clear, we're, we're being very careful in the spending uh, commitments that we are making in this election campaign. Uh, the government's finances are going to be tighter in the next term of Parliament. We've got to make sure that every commitment we put before the electorate stacks up and is fully costed and is fully paid for. That is a commitment that I'm giving to New Zealanders. Yes. 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 Those are different issues. Um, but yes, of course they are different issues. But right. fundamentally, the ch one of the biggest um, issues around changing uh, tax thresholds is that the money will go more indiscriminately to people on the highest incomes. Well, well, how, how are they different? How Working they for different? families is more targeted. Minister, yeah. as a loyal Labour servant, how is today ranked in terms of having to turn up at work and suck it up? I completely support what we're doing here. I've said to you, I've had my concerns in the past, those concerns have been met. What I want to do every day when I show up to work is know that I'm upholding Labour values, looking after our most vulnerable people, making their lives a little bit easier in a difficult period of time. You know, the Working for Families announcement today is really significant as well for targeting that support. So no, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to be campaigning on this versus unfunded tax cuts from the National Party. Yeah, yeah, fresh fruit and vegetable makes up a large proportion of the spend on groceries from low income households. Do you have the actual number that they spend? So in the it's lower than that four to five dollar average. Right? In the fact sheet that we put out, we've we've given the statistical analysis, and the point that I was making is if you're a low and middle income household, you spend a greater proportion of your weekly grocery yeah. shop on fruit on fruit and vegetables. Number. The Herald puts it about two dollars and twenty one cents a week that low income households will save. Does, it, does that sound right, right to you? No, it's a little higher than. That, yeah, um, between four and five dollars yeah. on our numbers, but, but, but using but the, the household lowest, expenditure the lowest survey data. Households, not average households. Um, I'd have to come back to you. Um, Carmel Stepanoni, can you just speak, please, to the significance of the working for families um, changes, but also um, from groups, for example, beneficiaries or pensioners, who, while they'd benefit from the GST off food, wouldn't get any of that direct targeted support and might feel like they would be needing it as well. Yeah, so it, it is targeted, and what we recognise is that um, there. Are a number of expenses that working families with children that they have um, and so this will go a long way towards supporting them with those expenses. Um, 1st of April we saw superannuation lift, benefit lift, minimum wage lift. Um, this is something else we can do that is targeted and supports families. Is there is always um, often criticism that beneficiaries do miss out on these, you know, with working for families they see that if, if the same reasons are being applied then beneficiaries should be benefited as well. We've made significant increases to benefits over the course of our time. Um, there's certainly more to do, but this is targeted as well. Is this Labour's tax policy, i.e. are there any more um, policies to come on the election campaign? So the fact sheet that we've set out, which I ho hopefully you will have received a copy of, um, sets out our, our full tax policy for the election. Is this the definer for you today? And, and you're trying to define what the campaign is about? as far as Labour's concerned. Well, I think it would be fair to say that this is the first significant campaign policy announcement that we're making, and there will be more to come. Prime Minister. You, you've reached way back to 2011 to find it. Are you out of fresh ideas? No. Prime Minister, would you expect people could, could see different products in their supermarkets as a result of this GST policy? I think the, the primary target of the policy is making sure that items that people are buying now, in terms of fruit and vegetables, don't have GST on them. You don't expect... You don't expect uh, to be able to fit. Oh, there may be some change in the packaging. For example, if you're buying a, a packaged salad, um, which has things like mayonnaise in it, they may take the mayonnaise out so that it can be um, free of GST. And what do you think of the, uh, the Greens policy this morning, grants and loans uh, for people to upgrade their homes to, to cleaner energy? Uh, any thoughts on it? 
Um, we also, uh, as a government and as a, and as a political party, want to support people to transition to um, cheaper, renewable energy. Um, we'll have our own Labour Party policy in due course on those issues. Well, that's a matter for the Greens. I mean, as, as I've said, relatively supportive of policies that help people to transition. That doesn't mean I'm signing up whole bottles to another party's policy. Can you just do a breakdown of the costing in terms of the GSC of fresh fruit and veg, um, the work for families changes, at least next year's one, compared to the 545 million of the depreciation? Yeah, so it's 2.2 uh, .2 billion over the forecast period for the um, GST of fresh fruit and vegetables, and that ramps up over time. We've got a little bit of it in this financial year and then into the next. And I think come out about 1.4 billion for the, uh, across the forecast period for working for families. Bear in mind we've got our operating allowances that we can draw from. What the depreciation does is effectively net off that 540 million per annum. How restrictive have you how how restricted have you been by the state of the books um, in this particular going into this campaign in particular? Oh, I don't make any apologies whatsoever with being careful with our finances. Um, we've committed to withdrawing that COVID support over time and making sure that we reinvest that in things like public services. Uh, it's not just New Zealand's economy, it's the world's economy. Um, we are going into a difficult period globally. You've seen what's happening in China. Um, this is going to be challenging How for New Zealand. How has it been in terms of your well, ability to you know, like fund and, and announce? I, I, I set some pretty clear goals um, a year ago for New Zealand that we would get into surplus across the forecast period and that we, we would keep debt under 30% of GDP. I'm committed to those goals because they matter for future generations as well. Only where it's appropriate. Right. Just, finances, just want to clarify that this entire policy isn't entirely funded. It's um, only the GST part is not the working for families. But the working for all of the, so yeah, I know you know this, Janae, but the way that the allowances work is that they're a net number. So what this, by taking building depreciation off, we, we effectively net out that cost and the remainder will be drawn from the operating allowance. Yes. So okay. it is. Uh, it is well, So this comes from allowances which have now been added to by the building depreciation coming up. Why don't, you, why don't you finish? How popular do you think GST of fresh fruit and veggies is going to be and can it turn around your diamond polls? I don't think New Zealanders vote on single issues when it comes to the polls. They want to know which party is proposing things that are going to best serve their overall interests, including creating the sort of society and economy that they want to be part of. The 10-point plan, we've now set out seven of the 10 steps in our 10-point plan. I think New Zealanders, when they look at that, they will see a party that's very much focused on the issues that they care about. I guess maybe reframing a little bit, how much are you hanging your hopes on fruit and veggies? Um, it's part of a 10-point plan um, to tackle the cost of living and to provide New Zealanders with meaningful support. If, well, your finance, uh, if your finance minister can have a role to do a maskless moment, how come your revenue, former revenue minister couldn't? I don't, I don't agree with that. Well, it's, well, well, it's yes. of the um, national to rule out working with Winston Peters. Just for the sake of clarity, are you able to provide your position on negotiating or forming a government with New Zealand first? I mean, previously you've said he's ruled you out. Have you, are you also ruling out Winston? Oh, I stand by the comments that I've made. And I also have said that you know, closer to the election we will set out a bit more about who our preferred partners in government might be. I'm not doing that today. But, but will you work with um, As I've said, we'll set that out close. Uh, well, well, we'll set that out shortly. So I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not making, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making announcements on that today. So will it be the start of the campaign? Are you thinking middle or the end? We'll let you know. What Christopher Luxon does is completely up to him. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And go the Matildas, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> That's much more enthusiastic. <laughs>